energy today. Hope you guys have a good weekend. Spring is springing. We saw some sun. That was good. And to uh, cast a shadow on everything, we have an exam coming up a week from Friday. Uh, okay, so uh, what I'm going to try to do today is finish up uh, nucleotide metabolism. I probably will do that. And if I get done, we'll actually go a little bit ahead and start on DNA replication, uh, which usually takes us a little bit longer to get through. So that'll give us a, a running start on that. Um, Last time I finished uh, talking about uh, purine synthesis, um, I bypassed salvage synthesis, and I also bypassed the um, degradation of purines. And I'm going to talk about both of those things today after I finish talking about deoxyribonucleotide uh, metabolism. So deoxyribonucleotide metabolism is, um, is odd and interesting. Um, it's odd in the sense that um, we make from scratch all of the ribonucleotides. And to make the deoxyribonucleotides, we've got to sort of take a little shunt off to the side of the synthesis of the ribonucleotides. Okay? Uh, it's not complicated, uh, although the, the, the individual pathways are a little complicated. But suffice it to say that the overall uh, scheme of deoxyribonucleotide synthesis looks something like this. So remember that in uh, the synthesis of both the purines and the pyrimidines, uh, we go through and we make the monophosphates, uh, with the exception of one nucleotide. One nucleotide is actually made as the triphosphate. Which one is that? You may remember? CTP is made as the triphosphate because it's made from UTP. Okay. Now what this figure shows is that uh, in order to make the deoxyribonucleotides, we have to start with the ribonucleoside diphosphates. Well, for ADP and GDP and UDP, that simply means that we stop them before they become triphosphates. But in the case of CTP, it means that we've actually got to take a phosphate off of that guy before we actually have a CDP. Okay? Now, that's just the way that they're made. Now, the beautiful thing about this is that one enzyme handles all the conversion of all of the uh, ribonucleoside diphosphates into deoxyribonucleoside diphosphates. And you'll notice that we have a DUDP here. Okay, thymidine nucleotides are made from uridine, the deoxyribonucleotide nucleotides, and I'll show you how that's done. But if we're going from A to deoxy A, or G to deoxy G, or C to deoxy C, or U to deoxy U, all of those use the enzyme ribonucleotide reductase. Now this is an interesting and unusual enzyme. I'm going to say some things about it today. It's interesting um, because of its mechanism. It's also interesting because uh, of its uh, unusual regulation. And again, we're starting we're going back to think about this balance the cells try to achieve with nucleotides. And for the deoxyribonucleotides, that balance is achieved through this enzyme right here. Okay? So one enzyme achieves all of that balance, and I'll show you how that's done uh, in just a bit. Okay. So ribonucleotide reductase is the enzyme that does that conversion. Again, notice we're starting with diphosphates in each case, and we're getting deoxyribonucleoside diphosphates here. Then we go from the deoxyribonucleoside diphosphates into the deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates. And I'll let you tell me what enzyme does that. Since we've already talked about it and there was one enzyme that did everything, and nobody knows what it is, everybody's looking back at their nose, nobody remembers this? It has four letters. And DPK. So NDPK, which was the one that took GDP to GTP, for example, is also the one that takes DGDP to DGTP. Okay? So NDPK is a very versatile enzyme, and it um, converts all the diphosphates into all the triphosphates. And this is a multi-step process. This does not happen in one step. Okay, this is very misleading. This is not a one-step process in getting to TTP. 
Okay, so that's kind of the, the territory that we've got for ourselves uh, for today. Now, uh, the uh, rapid nucleotide reductase, as I said, is an interesting enzyme. It is a, a, a dimer of dimers. So it has what are called two large subunits that are identical, called R1, and it has two small subunits that are identical, called R2. Okay? The R1 contains the active site. And this is the place where the reactions catalyzes that actually, and what this, what this enzyme catalyzes, I should also start with that. What this enzyme catalyzes is the conversion of the ribose in that deoxyribonucleoside diphosphate to a deoxyribose. So it's converting that ribose to a deoxyribose within the ribonucleoside diphosphate. And it's for this reason that I said in class earlier that we don't have free deoxyribose in the cell. The reason? Because it's converted within the ribonucleoside diphosphate. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Another interesting thing about this uh, enzyme is that the overall mechanism, which I'm really not going to go through, but the mechanism itself actually starts in the small subunits. Okay? And there's the formation of what's called a tyrosyl radical. And this radical, once it's formed, causes a series of electronic changes to happen that actually jump this junction and stimulate the active site to be able to do what it does. Okay? So the mechanism starts with the activation of a tyrosyl radical in the small subunits and those electronic differences are communicated literally electronically all the way into the large subunits which once that happens they are then able to um, catalyze the reactions that they catalyze. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. And I know you'd like to see this mechanism, and we're not gonna, you're, I'm not going to hold you responsible for this mechanism. So let me just show you what's happening, though, just so you get a bigger picture of what the enzyme is catalyzing. So you're not responsible for this, uh, this mechanism. Uh, here's the, the ribose that we start with in the overall reaction. And here are the side chains of the uh, respective uh, amino acids in that um, uh, active site. Okay. What happens in, as an initiating step is that these electronic changes that I talked about in the R2 subunit are communicated into the R1 subunit such that this removal of this proton becomes very easy. And the removal of this proton starts everything going off. So as a result of that activation in the R2 subunit, we ultimately have a free sulfur with an, extra, with, with a, with an unpaired electron out here. This guy um, uh, uh, attacks uh, this ribose ring, and we see a series of changes that happen as a result of that. And again, I'm not going to go through these changes. We see disulfides forming, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line is that this hydroxyl on position number two is converted to a hydrogen. Okay? So we're losing the oxygen uh, in the process of this. And as a consequence, we ultimately end up with a deoxyribonucleotide and that's what it looks like. There's the hydrogen instead of the, um, instead, of the, instead of the hydroxyl group that was on there. So that is a reduction. Whenever we go from an OH to an H, that is a reduction. And reduction, of course, requires electrons. The electrons for this reduction ultimately come, and notice I said ultimately, come from NADPH. So again, we see NADPH's involvement in the biosynthetic pathways that we've talked about before. And we end up with a deoxyribonucleoside. I'm sorry, deoxyribonucleotide. I said it wrong to myself. OK, now, so um, that's what happens um, uh, in that process. Now, there are uh, some um, uh, things we need to think about with respect to regulation. And so I'm going to jump down here to figure 2516 and talk a little bit about uh, the regulation. We're looking now at the R1 subunit, the large subunit. And within the R1 subunit, we see three sites that are interesting. Okay? First of all, we see the active site, which I told you was there. And of course, this is a dimer, so these are identical subunits just re reflected on each other. The active site is where the reaction is catalyzed. Okay? So that reaction mechanism that I just showed you is occurring at the active site here in the R1 subunit. Everybody got that? The active site 
uses substrates because, of course, substrates are necessary for a reaction to be catalyzed. Now, I've already told you that the substrates are ribonucleoside diphosphates. Okay? So the things that are going to bind in here are ribonucleoside diphosphates. Everybody with me so far? That's pretty straightforward. Now, we have two other allosteric sites on each subunit. So each of these has a different role, and each of the allosteric subunit, each of the allosteric sites binds triphosphates, not diphosphates. Okay? Now, you'll find, I've done this about three years running, well, I'll get in the middle of the lecture and I'll start diphosphating, triphosphating, and so forth. It's very easy to confuse these. So I'm going to try to lay the groundwork to start. Active site binds diphosphates, allosteric sites bind triphosphates. Okay? Now, the easiest allosteric site to understand is the activity site. The activity allosteric site, that's, that's even more confusing. So here's the active site. And here's the activity site, right? They could have picked a better name. We call it the green site, okay? So the green site, which is the activity site up there, or maybe we should call it, the, I guess the blue site would be better if we. <laughs> he's colorblind, right? Okay. The blue site, all right? We call it the blue site. The blue site is um, essentially controlling whether the enzyme is on or off. That's why they're referring to it as the activity site here. So as I said, there's two different things that can bind at the blue site. One thing that can bind at the blue site is ATP. When ATP binds at the blue site, the enzyme is active. It's on. Okay? Can the enzyme be on without anything bound at the active site? Yes, it can, but it's more on when the ATP is bound. Okay? All right. So either one of these uh, will activate that individual subunit. Now, the other thing that can bind at the blue site is DATP. Okay? DATP turns the enzyme off. And this sort of makes sense. DATP is used as a way of measuring how much the cell needs deoxyribonucleotides. So if DATP levels start rising, then the cell knows it's time to shut off the enzyme. That makes very good sense. On the other hand, as I said, when we go and cells make a commitment to go and replicate, there's a tremendous energy requirement. So having a lot of ATP makes a lot of sense to turn this enzyme on because the cell is going to be getting ready for replication. Okay? So these two things that control whether the enzyme is on or off make sense from uh, the point of view of what the cell actually needs. Now, the confusing part of this, and I, I even keep it simple, believe it or not, the confusing allosteric site is the specificity site, the yellow site. Okay? The specificity site helps to determine what binds at the active site. It helps to determine what binds at the active site. Okay? And it works, and this is where I'm simplifying because the, actual, but the reality is it's even more complicated than what I'm going to tell you. Okay? It works in a largely complementary fashion. Meaning that if I bind a DGTP right here, what I favor by binding over here are pyrimidines. So if I bind a DGTP here, I will favor binding of DCDP and DUDP here. Purines favor pyrimidines. Okay? Now that makes good sense because if I have a lot of purines, I know I'm going to need some more. If I have a lot of purines, I'm going to need some more pyrimidines. So I'm favoring the formation of pyrimidines. On the other hand, if I have a pyrimidine that binds here, like DCTP, then what will be favored here will be the purines, DADP and DGDP. Everybody with me? Did I keep my Ds and Ts correct? 
I got all confused last year. I got, I got them mixed up, and the students are just looking at me like this, which is worse than they usually look at me. Okay? Usually, you, know, you can tell if they're confused. And I can tell they were definitely confused. And then I got totally scrambled. So I'm going to repeat that, because all, it's all kind of confusing. All right, so we have the active site, which is where ribonucleoside diphosphates bind. Okay? So CDP, GDP, UDP, ADP are going to bind here. Okay? Active site, the blue site, is where the activity site is going to determine whether the enzyme is on or off. And that binds either ATP or DATP. If DATP binds, it doesn't matter anything else down here. The enzyme is off. If ATP binds, the enzyme is on. And then the specificity site determines what's going to bind in here. Okay? So if DCTP binds in here, I'm favoring purines, which means I'm going to favor GDP and ADP. If DGTP binds here, I favor binding of pyrimidines up here, which will favor UDP and CDP. Are we clear? OK. Questions on that? Yes, sir? So on the, the uh, activity site, does it only bind D ATP or does it bind D ATP? This guy up here? Yeah. This guy only binds D ATP or ATP. So the other two does not do They don't. And if you think about it, since they're balanced with ATP, all you have to do is read one to know the level. It's simple, it's efficient. Laurie? Can you have this one bound with one and this one bound with something else? Well, no, do you have to have both of them bound The enzyme can be active with nothing bound. Okay? So what binding of, of, for example, an ATP is going to do is it's going to activate even more, whereas a, D, whereas a DATP is going to turn it off. That's got to be the record I've ever had for fewest questions on that enzyme. Was I that clear or are you that confused? Yes? Okay, so what, what it controls at binding at the activity site are the ribonucleoside diphosphate. So if I said D, it's not D, it's GDP or CDP. Okay, so what binds, you talking about binding here? Okay, so what binds here are the D triphosphates. So DCTP or DUTP, or DATP, or DGTP, or even DTTP can bind here. <coughs> just, just saying, okay? So the nature of what they are determines which ribonucleoside diphosphates bind here. So if DGTP binds here, that is a purine, it will favor the binding of UDP and CDP up here. Okay? Okay, I had a question back here first. Yeah? Um, what would happen if ATP and one of the active sites and then DATP and the other active site? Okay, so if you have one and one and one and the other, you probably have somewhere in between. Okay? Keep in mind that you've got millions of these in the cell. So there's going to be a blend and there's going to be a lot of mixes of things. And so if we look at it in the simplest case, I think we're, we're, we're the best off. So either we think about it as DATP or ATP binding to the thing. Jenny? Can it work with nothing bound to the specificity site? Indeed it can. Okay? Now, you would expect that probably wouldn't happen very often because the cell typically will have some deoxyribonucleoside uh, triphosphates laying around. But yes, it, could, it can act without that. If that happens, then there's no specificity. It'll, it'll do anything. So if the deoxyribonucleotides are low, that might be a case. And then you just say, we, we need everything. Now, this enzyme balances the relative amounts of each of the deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates. And even though we haven't seen DTTP, I'm going to tell you that DUTP is a precursor of DTTP. So by controlling DUTP, we're indirectly controlling DTTP. Whoa. Was that much? Did I say it wrong? No? Okay. I just said it fast. All right. 
I'll, I'll remind you this as I'm going along. You don't need to write all that down right there. Okay, I'll remind you this. But all I, the, the main point is, is that all four of these guys, U, C, G, A, the deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates are regulated by ribonucleotide reductase. So we see the balance here. Kyle. Where is this taking place? Where is this taking place at? In the nucleus. In the nucleus. Okay. Now, that's what's happening with the balance of these individual nucleotides. Okay? And so now you can see how those are made. We need to say a word about uh, making T. Okay? This is one of your book's worst figures. Okay? And in fact, I'm not even going to start there. I don't like that figure. So let's let's. Um, I don't have a figure. Okay, so I will start there. All right. I need to tell you a story though, and the story is an interesting one. So, you've seen how you can make DUDP, right? You make DUDP and uh, from UDP using ribonucleotide reductase, right? So you might think, okay, well, we want to make T. Why don't we just convert DUDP into DTDP and we're set? Well, it turns out cells don't do that. Okay? Cells do not convert DUDP into DTDP. In fact, cells do something odd. They take DUDP and then they, they use NDPK to make DUTP. So they put a phosphate on it. Wasting, it would seem as if they're wasting some energy. It's even worse. DUTP can be used by DNA polymerase in the same way that T can. So your DNA can contain some U's. Your DNA can some, contain some U's. Am I running out of juice again? No, nope, I'm just talking up. Okay. So you've got DUTP, the polymerase can use it. One question might be, well, why did we even have T in the first place? Why didn't, the, why didn't we just have U's in, in, instead? There's a very good reason. U is chemically unstable. It's not nearly as chemically stable as T is. So the original DNAs may well have had U's in them and use U exclusively instead of T. But the use of T evolved because T is chemically stabler and provides longevity over a longer period of time. If your DNA was full of U's, you would be having some of those chemical alterations going on as we speak. You'd be mutating sitting here. Mutation can be good, mutation can be bad. On the whole, mutation isn't very good. So stability makes sense, okay? So it's not in the cell's interest to have much DUTP sitting around. So the cell says, okay, well, I have a solution to that. The solution is enzymatic. So the cell makes an enzyme called DUTPase. Okay? This is a convoluted pathway. We haven't gotten to, even gotten to T yet, right? We're still in the, in, the, in the DU phase. So we've gone from DUDP to DUTP, and the... DUTP is cleaved by DUTPase down to DUMP, which is everybody's favorite nucleotide. Okay? We're back taking a dump, right? That's my only joke for the day. Okay, we're, we're at dump. All right? Now, dump is actually right here. So I've now gotten you to the point where we're ready to make thymidine nucleotides. All right? To make a thymidine nucleotide, we've got to take a U, a DU, and we've got to put a methyl group onto it. Now, the reason I don't like this figure at all, here's the methyl donor. The methyl donor is that long mouthful of the name I told you about before, the folate derivative that I showed you the figure on the uh, individual nucleotides. I said, here's where this carbon came from, and I said, that's a very long mouthful of a name, and you'll see it again. We're going to see it a couple times today. This guy is donating the methyl group that becomes this right here. Okay? I abbreviate this name, and there's several different forms of this molecule, but I like to abbreviate this guy and call it tetrahydrofolate, or THF. Tetrahydrofolate. You can call it THF if you want. 
The dumb thing about this figure is it makes it look like you get over here and it's still attached to the nucleotide, and it's not. Why they put this thing over here, I don't know. Okay? This should draw it out of the way so that you don't have to confuse it. This is not attached to this nucleotide. Okay, so the blue is completely separate with the exception of this blue that came from right there. Okay? All right. So THF served as a methyl donor, and by putting a methyl group onto DUMP, you make DTMP, and DTMP is chemically stabler than DUMP. Okay? Now, how are we going to get that to, to DTDP? Anybody know? What's that? We're going to add a phosphate. <laughs> There's the simple answer. What enzyme is going to do it? It's going to be an NMP kinase. It's going to be a nucleoside monophosphate kinase. In this case, it's going to be TMP kinase. So we put a phosphate on there. We've got DTDP. How do we get to DTTP? This is your turn. NDPK. Okay. So NDPK is going to finally give us DTTP. So now we're ready to go ahead and make DNA. Okay. Now, this uh, molecule here turns out to be of considerable interest for a variety of reasons. Okay? And let me show you a couple of them. One of them is shown right here. All right? Here is uh, another form of that molecule. This one is simply called tetrahydrofolate. It's slightly different than the one I, call, I showed you before, but for our purposes it suffices. Okay? Tetrahydrofolate is the reduced form of the molecule. The oxidized form of the molecule is known as dihydrofolate, or, dihydrofolate okay, or DHF. So we have DHF and we have THF. DHF being the oxidized form and THF being the reduced form. And we can see that the electrons used to reduce it are NADPH. Okay? This is a reduction reaction. And the enzyme that catalyzes this reduction reaction is very, very important. Now, let me go back to the last figure and before I do this one and show you one more time something. Okay? In this figure that I didn't like, I'm left with this guy up here. I didn't point out the name to you. We've gone from a tetrahydrofolate to a dihydrofolate. Okay? If we want to continue to do nucleotide metabolism, we're going to need to convert this guy back to this guy. Now this is actually a, a, a multi-step process, but one of the steps is shown in the next slide. So one of the steps involves this reaction of dihydrofolate going to tetrahydrofolate. Okay? Why do we care about this? The reason we care about this is because the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is known as dihydrofolate reductase, or DHFR. Very simple. And DHFR is a target of anti-cancer drugs. Now, there is a compound that resembles these structures called methotrexate. M-E-T-H-O-T-R-E-X-A-T-E. -E. Methotrexate. Methotrexate binds to dihydrofolate reductase and inhibits it. It's a reversible inhibition. Okay? It's a reversible inhibition. Let's think about a cancer cell. A cancer cell is dividing rapidly. Cancer cells, therefore, need to make deoxyribonucleotides fairly rapidly. So if we give a batch of cells, let's say we have a mixture of cancer cells and non-cancer cells on the same Petri dish, and we put onto this Petri dish some methotrexate and leave it on there for a short period of time and then we take it off, what will happen is the cells that are dividing the most rapidly will be the most susceptible to this drug because they need to make nucleotides the fastest. So methotrexate will preferentially kill those cells which are dividing the most rapidly. If that happens to be a rapidly growing cancer cell, you've got a chemotherapy drug. If it happens to be the lining of your stomach or the follicles of your hair, you're going to have some side effects of the chemotherapy drug. OK? 
Okay? So that's what's happening with one type of chemotherapy treatment. You're targeting the ability of the cells to make nucleotides. If you can't make T's, you can't make DNA. You just can't do it. Okay, questions about that? Good. Okay. Anti-cancer drug targets. Okay, now this, you see the whole figure here. And this shows the multi-step process. You don't need to worry about this diagram. I'm just showing it to you for um, um, general purposes. But here's the reaction that we had. DUMP going to DTMP. This enzyme, which I didn't tell you, is called thymidylate synthase. And yes, you should know the name of that enzyme. Converts DUMP to DTMP. Thymidylate synthase can also be a target, uh, can also be targeted by a compound, and that also can serve as an anti-cancer compound. More commonly, this one is used. Okay, and there are different forms or different molecules that resemble dihydrofolate that are used in that process. This is the common target. Okay, and like I said, we're not worried about the figure itself. That's not the important thing here. Um, the fluorodeoxyuridylate is a suicide inhibitor, um, and it's a suicide inhibitor because it ends up becoming, uh, creating an intermediate that is in fact locked to the enzyme and doesn't get unlocked. That's not, that's more, mostly a trivia interest. That's not something we'll, we'll be concerned about. Okay, here's methotrexate and the related compound am aminoptrin, which uh, looks rather like this. They differ in the composition of the R group right there. Okay? Now, some of the folate derivatives are actually used as antibiotics as well. Okay? Here's one of the precursors of those compounds. It's called trimethylprim. And trimethylprim is a very potent um, uh, inhibitor, uh, a very potent, in, um, I shouldn't say, a very potent antibiotic for bacteria. And the reason is the bacteria make their folates from scratch. Okay? They make them from scratch. So if you give them something that mucks up their machinery for making folates, they can't grow. And trimethylprim is used as an antibiotic for that reason. It affects bacteria. It doesn't affect human beings because we don't make folates from scratch. We get them in our diet. Okay? Now, that means that we have to have folates in our diet. And one of the things that's known um, is that if we, if we have a lot of problems, if we don't get folates in our diet. Okay? So if you are a uh, woman who is pregnant, uh, you will be uh, cautioned to be sure to get plenty of folates in your diet because it's known that a deficiency of folate is linked to a very terrible uh, neurological uh, syndrome called spinal bifida. Um, that results directly from a deficiency of folate uh, in your diet. Okay. And folate in your diet is just a good idea in general anyway. All right, so that's uh, DNTP synthesis and considerations relevant uh, to that. I want to just say a brief word or sort of remind you about the regulation that I've been talking about so far. So we've seen regulation occurring at several levels. One level we saw was um, at the level of synthesis of the pyrimidines. That was controlled by ATCase. And you may remember that ATCase allowed us to balance the relative amounts of purines and pyrimidines. ATP activated ATCase. CTP inhibited ATP uh, 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 inhibited ATCase. I can't say the word. Okay. Purine biosynthesis is uh, a little bit complicated, but the, the main enzyme that we're, we're concerned with is actually right here, not over here. I haven't talked about this one. This enzyme over here was the one that I call PRPP or mitotransferase. And PRPP or mitotransferase was controlled by both AMP and GMP. So if we had plenty of both, then the enzyme was inhibited. If we only had one, then the enzyme was partially on to allow the enzyme to fill up to make enough of the other one. So it was through PRPP amidotransferase that cells balanced A's and G's. Cells balanced A's and G's. To balance C's and U's, that happened through CTP synthase, which was in the pyrimidine pathway. CTP synthase was inhibited by CTP. 
So balancing C's and U's is managed by the pyrimidine uh, pathway enzyme known as CTP synthase. CTP synthase was the enzyme you may recall that converts UTP into CTP. So CTP inhibits that enzyme and allows UTP concentration to stay high. So it's through that enzyme that C and U is balanced. All right, so the result of this is we've balanced purines, we've balanced pyrimidines, We've balanced A's and G's, we've balanced U's and C's, so now all four of these guys should be relatively in the proper amounts. Then through ribonucleotide reductase, we balance the relative amounts of the deoxyribonucleoside diphosphates. This is a much more confusing figure, and you are not responsible for this, okay? There are things on here that I have not talked about that I'm not going to hold you responsible for. I leave it, and believe me, this, this, even this is a simplification of this enzyme. I like to think about purines binding the uh, specificity site favoring purine, purines binding the specificity site favoring pyrimidines binding the activity site, the active site. Now I'm doing it. Okay? And pyrimidines binding to the specificity site favoring purines binding to the active site. Okay. Blah, blah. All right. Now, as I said earlier, the last thing that happens is, of course, we have balance of T achieved by virtue of the fact that we had balance of U to begin with. Since we had balance of U, we had balance of DU, and DU went to DUTP, DUMP, and DTMP. So indirectly, we achieved balance of T because of the fact that we had U in the proper balance. Okay. Questions on that? I know that's a mouthful of stuff, and I'm throwing a lot of things at you fairly quickly. Let's stretch. We're going to stretch them all. Let's get up and stretch. How about a stretch? A nice Monday morning stretch. Stand up. All hail biochemistry. We could jog around the room. Well, the last topic we're going to talk about with respect to nucleotides actually has some significant health implications. And these are uh, the, uh, the uh, considerations of nucleotide catabolism, that is, the breakdown of nucleotides. And it turns out that the breakdown of nucleotides, when it is inhibited, causes some severe problems um, that we're going to be talking just a little bit about. A very interesting one of these is called Severe Combined Immune Deficiency, or SCID. And you probably have heard a little bit about this one. Um, this one, um, it, back in the about 1970s, 1980s, uh, gave rise to um, a, uh, a very uh, interesting, sort of sad phenomenon of a, of a young boy known as Bubble Boy. Um, who was enclosed in a, a chamber for his entire life. You may know about Bubble Boy. Most people know about Bubble Boy. Okay. So what Bubble Boy had was severe combined immune deficiency. And this is a relatively rare uh, phenomenon, but it is uh, not unknown. Obviously, he had it. And in his case, he had a severe form, and um, he was diagnosed very early. So they recognized that because he had this, he had virtually no immune system. And having no immune system meant that virt virtually any bacteria that infected him would, could, could potentially kill him. So they put him into a sterile chamber, um, literally at birth, and he lived his entire life uh, in that chamber, uh, exiting shortly before he died uh, uh, when he was, I think, a teenager. Uh, and the reason he had this uh, syndrome was because he lacked the enzyme, a very important uh, enzyme in the uh, breakdown of uh, uh, nucleotides, breakdown of purine nucleotides called adenosine deaminase. So he's lacking this enzyme right here. Now, you might wonder really why that's a problem, okay? Because what this is doing is it's a pathway that's leading to the breakdown of this ultimately into something that goes into your urine. So why did he not have uh, a functional immune system? 
And the jury is still out about exactly why this happens. But one of the things I've told you today gives you a very good clue about why these people don't have much of a functional immune system. It turns out that if you're lacking this enzyme, as the bubble boy was, your levels of DATP increase 30 to 100 fold. Now, based on what I've told you today, what's going to happen to this kid's immune system if this happens in his immune cells? He's not, he's not going to be able to divide the immune cells, and this, this preferentially, and again, it's not really known why, this preferentially strikes the immune cells. So their levels of DATP are 30 to 100 fold higher than that of a person who doesn't have this. And as a consequence, the ribonucleotide reductase in these cells is going to be essentially shut off. No ribonucleotide reductase inside the immune cells. Immune cells can't divide. Immune cells, of course, have to divide to do what they do. And therefore, you're pretty much hosed. And so that's what uh, happened as a result of his lacking this. Now, there are a few cases where this has uh, children who lack this enzyme have, in fact, been treated uh, through genetic modification uh, to receive the proper form of this enzyme. And in some cases, it has worked. Uh, it has been sort of on hold, though, because this involves altering the genome. And in some cases, altering the genome has caused cancers in the children who have received this. So it's not a complete uh, answer. Uh, genetic engineering is not a complete answer to solving these problems, at least not yet. But for some children, this has been a relief to actually uh, have received a functional enzyme and give them uh, relatively normal lives. OK. Other questions? Or any questions? Yes? How do you find out that you have it? That's a good question. I don't know uh, why they suspect it in the first place. I, I suspect that today they routinely check it uh, because you can do DNA screens for a wide variety of genetic diseases pretty easily. In his day, I don't know what, what the, the thinking was. I don't know why they, they checked it. They may have, the, the parents may have had another child who, who had died of it. That's my guess, but I, I don't know. I see the other hand? It is a recessive trait, yeah. Yes? Is that how they make the knockout mice? No, the knockout mice are made uh, using uh, a different strategy, although knockout mice, uh, knockout mice, the term knockout mouse re refers to removal of any gene. So a not Oh, to make immuno compromised mice. Um, you know, that, uh, those aren't knockout mice. Knockout mice refers to something else. Um, I imagine you could. I don't know. I'm not a mouse expert. I don't know, though. Um, my suspicion is that you, that'd be one, one dandy way to do it with a knockout mouse that lacked that gene. Yes? It's not what? That's a different one. That's a different one. Okay, so his question was, I said that methotrexate was, an irrever was a reversible inhibitor, but then later I said that it was a suicide inhibitor. The one that was a suicide inhibitor was not methotrexate. That's the fluorouracil uh, compound. So they're different things. Yeah. And by the way, I should mention, uh, thanks for, for reminding me of that, I should mention that when you give someone chemotherapy, you give them methotrexate, what you do is you give it to them for a period of time, and then you withdraw it. Because if you don't, you will kill them. And so in the process of killing the rapidly growing cells, what you're doing is you're hoping that you preferentially kill cancer cells. But if you don't withdraw that, then, in fact, you will kill all the cells. And that's obviously not a good uh, chemotherapy strategy. The patient doesn't survive. Yes, Cassandra. Is this enzyme involved in breaking down bacterial DNA also? Um, I'm not sure I said the question. In your immune system, you mean? No. No. So the question is, is this enzyme involved in uh, damaging bacteria that invade your immune system? Actually, it's not. So macrophages play a role in doing that. And macrophages actually use chemicals in some cases, like H2O2, to kill the bacteria, because the bacteria don't have catalase um, to uh, have survival. OK, so that's one uh, interesting sidelight of nucleotide catabolism. Here's another one. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> All right. It reminds me that my, my answer for that one comes from this figure as well. Okay, 
So there's other places in this uh, strategy where we can have problems. So if we look at this normal nucleotide metabolism, what we see is that the purines, here's the, here's the adenine uh, uh, containing nucleotides coming this way, and here's the guanine containing nucleotides coming this way, and they converge right here at xanthine. You'll notice that this precursor called hypoxanthine, which I'll talk about in a minute, is converted into xanthine by xanthine oxidase, and that the guanine nucleotides can go to xanthine um, directly. Okay? Now, what's interesting is these guys converge here. Xanthine oxidase, which catalyzed this reaction, also catalyzed this reaction. I'm not asking you to memorize these reactions. Don't worry about that. Okay? The big picture is what's important, because what's happening is they're making uric acid. Uric acid is an excretory compound for birds. Okay? That's how they get rid of excess nitrogen. It's an excretory compound for Dalmatians, of all things. Okay? Other dogs use urea as we do, but Dalmatians um, actually excrete uric acid. And anybody here ever have a Dalmatian? Are they very sick dogs? They, they, do they hurt? Are they in pain? You notice this? Not yours? Okay. Yeah. So I'll explain why that happens in a second. And it happens because they have a lot of uric acid. Now, we normally convert uric acid into urate, and this is very water soluble. It goes out in our urine, ultimately broken down into urea. Okay? Back up, back up, back up. Urate goes, urate gets broken down into urea, which is water soluble. Okay? Urate itself, if it ionizes, is in fact water soluble. The problem is that urate does not ionize very readily. And as a consequence, when it doesn't ionize, it can crystallize. And that was actually what I was showing you on the next figure. Now, what happens? If you have a diet that's rich in purines, what will happen is you will produce a lot of uric acid. And if uric acid is readily being converted to urea, no problem. If something slows down that production of urea, and uric acid starts to accumulate, you start forming crystals of uric acid all over your body. And most commonly, you form it at the lowest place in your body because gravity is pulling everything down. Okay? When this happens, you can get crystals forming in your big toe. And what you get is the most painful big toe that anybody's ever had in their life. You have a disease known as gout. Okay? So gout arises from accumulation of uric acid. It usually happens at the lowest place in your body. Usually you notice the symptoms first in your big toe. And these crystals of um, uric acid that are forming are aggravating the nerves that are internal uh, to the big toe or wherever this, these things happen to be. Now, Dalmatians frequently are cited as, as, as animals, as dogs that have that are a very painful life because they're loaded with uric acid. And they're frequently very sickly. They don't have as much mobility as other dogs do uh, for that reason. Okay? And if you have a, a, a Dalmatian that doesn't have that problem, you may be maybe not a pure Dalmatian or something to that effect, or maybe you just had lucky you got a good one that didn't have that problem. But uric acid causes that, that problem big time. Now, what I want to show you is how you avoid it. You avoid it with a compound called allopur oh, here we go, called allopurinol. So if you go to your doctor and you complain about a pain in your big toe, the doctor is going to give you allopurinol. And what allopurinol does is it binds to uh, xanthine oxidase. It looks like hypoxanthine. It binds to xanthine oxidase, okay, and the product of that inhibits xanthine oxidase. So as a consequence, what happens, you don't make all of this. Okay? So you're stopping the production of uric acid in its tracks, and you start accumulating these other things which really aren't a problem. Because what happens is now you're going backwards with these things. You're actually favoring the salvage of these bases to be made into new DNAs. So by treating with allopurinol, you're avoiding uric acid and favoring salvage pathways that are making new deoxyribonucleotides. Yes, sir? Do you know if they make that for dogs? Because I know for Dalmatians, it is kind of feed low purine diet. I'm sure they make them for dogs. I'm sure, I'm sure that it's available, yeah. What is a low purine diet? 
What is a low purine diet? Most of our diets today are actually relatively high in purine. Okay? So gout used to be referred to as a rich man's disease back in the old days when there wasn't a lot of meat, there wasn't a lot of red wine, red meat, and so forth that were available. Now today, almost everybody's eating those sorts of things. You might wonder, why don't we all have gout? And the answer is, maybe in time you will. Okay? Uh, but seriously, in the old days, the only people who ever got gout were people who had those things. So the most purine-rich things are red meat and red wine. So if you avoid those, you're in good shape. All right, I'll talk about HGPRT next time, and see you guys then. Somebody who actually went through chemo, and he uh -huh. said it was uh, he had like a lot of metal tasting in his mouth, and it's like he was breathing fire, like it burned. Yep. Is that because the cells in the mouth divide so rapidly and it attacks the cells? Could the be. Mouth? Keep in mind, there's many different types of chemotherapy, yeah. but in fact, uh, a lot of things will attack. Will tackle things that are divi dividing fairly rapidly. A lot of things people will report is that the, the, the ends of their fingers get numb and so forth, and it's because the nerve endings themselves are not growing as rapidly as they need to. Okay. 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 Oh, so you wanted to set up. I tell you what, we're we're, we're we're plenty early right now. Can you check with me next next week? Are you around next week? Yeah. Okay. Um, why don't you send me uh, your, your name again? Is Levi Davis. Levi. Okay. So send me an email, and we'll find a time to meet next week and set something up. So you can take it say on on Thursday, I think. Yeah. Okay. We'll we'll set something up for Thursday. Okay. Okay. Thanks for checking in with me. Yes, sir. Is the 